Good morning, Center Point. How is everybody? Everybody's still coming in. This is the way it is. Everybody, y'all are just late during the summer. This is the way it is. But we're glad you're here. God, glad that God woke you up this morning and said, "Come to church." And we're glad you're here at First United Methodist Church, and especially here at Center Point with us this morning. If you are a visitor with us today, we've got a lot of you over here. If just one of you will fill out one of these cards, that'd be great. Um, I got. I would have a lot of phone calls to make if I had to. To respond to every single one of you, but we're glad you're here with us. And we have, we have. Is there a spokesperson from the group that would like to, to say something? I didn't call on you. I didn't warn you, but we want to welcome you. And we want to say hi. And we would like to know who you are. <laughs> Y'all working, working in the area uh, from Michigan. I think. I think I saw a shirt from Michigan. So, welcome, welcome down south. Welcome home. And glad you're here with us today and chose Center Point to be with us. Uh, um, but if you are a visitor or, or a guest of someone this morning, there's a green card in the seat in front of you. If you'll please fill that out so we'll know who you are and um, that we can, we can um, contact you throughout the week. Uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, let's, let's run our video announcements. Good morning. Welcome to worship with us. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. These are your Sunday updates. The Teeny Tanner Rosebud Memorial Fund is an opportunity for you uh, to honor the birth of a precious little one um, in your family. Uh, simply pick up a form and complete that and return that to the office. Um, and the following Sunday, a rosebud will be placed on the altars of both the sanctuary and Wesley Hall uh, to, to celebrate the birth of your precious little one. Hello, I'm Larry, I'm with your missions team. And I'm also sometimes known as Maurice. The Pompatus of Love. No, that's just one of my favorite songs by the Steve Miller Band. It's a song called The Joker. And The Joker reminds me of juggling. So I'm going to try to juggle. Well, I'm not so good at it, but sometimes I am. There we go. Hey, juggling reminds me of something else. The teachers out at John Cotton Taylor have to juggle because they don't have everything that they need. Deb Riles went out and met with the teachers and found out exactly the needs that they had that weren't being met by the school system. And so we want to be able to help them and support them. So that's our local mission. In front of Wesley Hall, there's a list uh, and a bucket that you can drop off items that, that the teachers need. And uh, on that list, some of them are used tennis balls. So we've actually got some of those, but we could use some more. Um, beyond that, though, if you'd like to just make a contribution, just write a check out to the First United Methodist Church and put Tigers on there. And that's the John Cotton Taylor Tigers. Um, and thanks to Stephen for bringing this up to us because we really appreciate making us aware of the needs in our community. And really, I think Stephen is the pompatus of love. So next time you see Stephen, please refer to him as Maurice. Vacation Bible School begins tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. It's not too late to register, but all of us as a church, uh, let us be in prayer this week uh, that Vacation Bible School can be an exciting and fun time for our children. As always, if you have any announcements that you'd like to share with the congregation or would like to have as part of these video announcements, please be feel free to contact me in the office. Uh, I'll be happy to set up a time to meet with you and to record a video with you at your convenience. Lord be with you and may you have a blessed time in worship with us this morning. Right. So now those of you who are asking why I'm wearing Maurice this morning, it's because of Larry. Um, I do what I'm told. Uh, <laughs> Let's bow our heads as we uh, go, to, go to God and worship this morning. Lord, we thank you for gathering us here this morning. We ask that your presence fall fresh upon us today, that we may be um, keenly aware of you right here with us this day. Um, open our minds and our ears so that we may hear with joy um, what you have to say to us this day. And, and we ask that as we sing and praise now and give you glory for the things you have done in our lives, that we may, we may truly worship in a way that is glorifying to you. Uh, this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I invite you to stand together as we sing.
with me. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being willing to come and live in our hearts. And thank you, Lord, also for our failures, for letting us know when it is that we need you. Um, if it wasn't for the things that we do wrong, the failures that we make, the things that we need you to come and redeem us for, we wouldn't know our relationship with you. We wouldn't know that we need you each and every day. And thank you, Lord, for that. And thank you for coming and just being with us as we go out today into the world. And it's easy to forget that you're right there beside us. And we just thank you so much, Lord, for being with us every step of the way. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, family. Yeah, good to see you. Uh, I want to remind you, if you will, take out of your bulletins. You should have received an insert like this. This is our daily compass points on one side of this or scriptures that go along with today's message. Um, this, this summer, uh, starting from now until Labor Day, we're going to be going through the Gospel of Luke together. Um, and so this week, I invite you every, every day to read part of chapter one of the Gospel of Luke. And, and that will uh, go back to the message um, for today, and on the back side is a more of a blank sheet of paper. This is a place for you to, to take notes. If I trust and hear that if you come to worship with an open heart and open mind, that God will say something to you, um, that you'll learn something that you didn't know before, and um, that something that will be useful for you in your discipleship journey as you leave this place. And uh, so, there's a place for you to write um, write that down, whatever it is that God says to you, either through me or in spite of me, in this message this morning. Our scripture this morning, I'm just going to read uh, four verses out of the first chapter of Luke, um, but we're going to be talking about the entirety of the chapter of Luke um, today. So uh, if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to, to turn um, to the Gospel of Luke. If not, these verses should be on the screen uh, behind me. And Luke writes this. He begins his Gospel this way. He says, Many people have applied themselves to the task of compiling an account of the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use what the original eyewitnesses and servants of the word handed down to us. And now, after having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, I have also decided to write a carefully ordered account for you, most honorable Theophilus. I want you to have confidence in the soundness of the instruction you have received. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Um, so I've, I've felt, um, first of all, I'm glad to be back with you after a couple of weeks away. And last week, Ken had a wonderful message for you. And um, while well, I preached at 8.30 and 11, and uh, I'm glad to be back with my Center Point family. Um, I've missed you guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to have some time away with, with my wife and son, but um, I've missed y'all too and missed being with you. And um, again, I have have new friends now over here that I'm glad to, to call you my friends and glad you're here in worship with us. Um, but over the, the beginning part of this summer and even into the spring, I felt God um, leading me in a certain direction to go with you uh, this summer um, to give us a picture of Jesus, to give us a picture to go on of Jesus and who Jesus is uh, through the eyes of um, the scriptural account of the gospel in Luke. 
Um, and so I don't want you to, to get stressed out and think about this as a series that we're about to get into, uh, whereas you'll, you'll have to be here and participate every single week. Um, but I'd like for this to be a challenge for us from now until Labor Day um, to read together as a Centerpoint family um, the gospel according to Luke. Uh, because I think you'll find some very um, interesting things about who Jesus is and how we can live our lives as in response to what Jesus has done for us um, uh, through, through, this, through, um, through the Gospel of Luke. So part of each message um, from now until later day will seem part of like a Bible study up front, and then, then I'll get into more of a, a sermon or, or a message, if you will, toward the end. Um, but I'd like for us to take a look at the Gospel of Luke together. Uh, my prayer for this is that God will speak something to you, God will say something to you over the next several weeks um, that you didn't know before about Jesus or you didn't know before about the scriptures. Uh, but more importantly, my prayer for you is that, that uh, you'll, be, you, you'll be challenged to, to read some scripture on your own outside of just coming to church this week or from week to week. And I know I've said this before, but I think it's um, worth repeating that I think it is a good challenge for us as Christians to, to remember that this book should be the central reading focus of our lives. Um, so many of us now are tempted by other things to read and get our sources and stuff from, from other places, like um, there's another book called Facebook um, that we find ourselves reading a lot of content on, and we often just leave this on a shelf somewhere. Um, but I think it's a good thing to, to keep this book central to our lives. And, and part of that is I know that it's dawning to, to hear some, some very faithful Christians who say that they read the Bible every year, read through the entire scripture every single year. And, you know, thank God for those people who, and I'm inspired by those who can, who can make that challenge, make that discipline every day of their lives. But I know that that sounds daunting to a lot of us. And so if we think that we have to be, a, the only way we can be a good Christian is to read through the entire Bible every year, um, we might just forget it all together. In fact, I read this um, <coughs> survey that just came out a, a year or so ago that said that, that the number of Christians that actually, it was a focus on how, script, how Christians relate to the Bible, and that a third of Christians, only a third of Christians, um, read the Bible as a daily, daily exercise, make it central to their life. Uh, that means two-thirds of Christians don't necessarily do that. And that's a lot of us that are Christians, right? Another third of those of that whole, um, that claim to be Christians, uh, will read Scripture when they have to. Um, either when something's troubling them in their lives, or, they, or they're in a group together, and the group says, you know, now it's time to open our Bibles and read something. Um, they'll do that. And a third of Christians don't crack open the Bible at all. Um, which is quite, a, quite stunning to me to think about that, but... This study even found that 20% of Christians have never read the Bible, have never read any word of the Bible, um, or if they have, it's just been a verse or two throughout the entirety of their lives. Um, I think that's kind of sad, but, but this is the book God gives us, so I want us to be in that. And so um, I think it's important for us to, to read through the Gospel of Luke at least together um, this summer. A good challenge that I think for us is to pick a Gospel a year. Um, if, if you're new to reading the Bible and making that a, a habit for you, is to pick one gospel a year, whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and to make, make that gospel a, the central word for your life that year. If you, just, if you don't read anything else, read one gospel a year. Um, and I think that's a good place to start. Hopefully, you'll, you'll want to read more than that, um, but that's, that's a good place, I think, to start, especially for young Christians and those who are new to the faith. That's a good thing to challenge them to do. Just pick one gospel and let that be God's word to you for a year. And so this year, the gospel of Luke has kind of been my, my gospel that I'm following. And I read a, read a lot of other scripture as well, but, but I'm trying to focus my life and hear and see what, what Jesus is like and let my relationship, my personal relationship, grow through the gospel of Luke and what Luke tells us. Reminder, the gospel means the good news. And if it is good news, I think that it's, you know, it's important for us to, to think about it as good news as Christians and to read it as good news and to, to look at these gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John and, and to let them be transformative to us. Help them, let, those, let the words that God has inspired these people to write for us that's been passed on from generation to generation to, to inspire us and to inform our lives and to help us grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. And these Gospels together give us a great picture, a very interesting picture of who this central figure for Christianity is, who this, who this Christ figure is, who, who Jesus is to us. 
And as we do some Bible study together, I, I, there's a couple of ways that we get this picture of who Jesus is that we follow and that we call the Lord of our lives. And one of those ways is to take all of the Gospels together and to, to formulate a, a similar picture about what all of these different eyewitness accounts say who Jesus is. It's, um, the, the way that this kind of study is done is um, referred to kind of as, a, as an eyewitness um, account. Say that you, know, you were in the middle of downtown Washington at a, at a crossroads and there was four people standing on different corners of an intersection and they saw a car wreck happen right in front of their eyes. And uh, the police investigators, the first thing they want to do is go to each of those eyewitnesses um, and to have them write down just as quickly as they can and what they saw, how they saw it, what, what their perspective is on what they saw. And this is kind of like what scholars think the Gospels are like. These are, these are witnesses. These are people who have heard the stories of Jesus firsthand. They've seen, some of them have seen Jesus in action and, and they've written down what they, thought, what, what they thought was most important about seeing Jesus. But like those who are investigating a crash, what they'll say is that you know, everybody that has a perspective, they, they bring their own biases to it. Some of them have other situations that are on their mind. Maybe they didn't see the car wreck exactly the same way as someone else because they have different vantage points. Or, or maybe they didn't see it all, so their mind, they say, fills in the blanks of what they didn't see so that it makes sense to them. And some biblical scholars like to think that that's how we can really get the only picture of Jesus that really matters is if we, we take all the biases out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the extra stuff that doesn't make sense or doesn't line up exactly, and, and that's how we get the best picture of Jesus that we can find. But I think there's another way that we can look at the Gospels, let them inform our lives, and to, to help, us, help us see who Jesus is really is, to help us grow in this relationship with Jesus Christ we're supposed to have. And that, that is just to look at one, one gospel, to look closely at, at one of them at a time and to hear how God has inspired that person to write about Jesus and to, to see where maybe that gospel writer's life is and, and where our lives are and to, to see what, what God is inspiring that person to teach us. So I'd like for us to take Luke as an example, and if you will follow me with this. Luke is the longest of the four Gospels. Um, by word count, it, it's the longest. And, and because of that, Luke says himself that he, he has seen all of these other different accounts of who Jesus is. Luke is not an eyewitness of Jesus himself, but he's read all of these different things about Jesus, and he has decided to sit down and write a carefully, he calls it a carefully ordered account, an account of, of what we have seen in Jesus' life and to give us a story that makes sense about who Jesus is. And because of that, he, he writes the longest of the four Gospels. But also because of that, it says 35% of Luke's Gospel is unique only to Luke. You know, if you've read the Gospels before, you find this, the, some of the story is the same, some of the wording is the same, but in, in Luke's Gospel, 35% of what he writes is stuff, that, is stuff that he writes alone, his unique perspective on who Jesus is. And that's what I want us to focus on over the next several weeks, is that 35% of Luke's Gospels that is unique to him. And right up front, I want to talk about um, what Luke's account is of of the preparation time leading up to Jesus being on earth. This is something that's unique to Luke. The other Gospels don't really go into detail about, about the, the preparation of Jesus coming to live with us. And Luke spends two wonderful chapters on this. We'll focus on chapter one today, and next, next week we're going to focus on chapter two, which is the Christmas story. Um, so we're going to have Christmas in July, for real next week. So if you've got some red you want to wear, some Christmas stuff um, that, you, that you need to go up into your attic and find, next week would be a good time for you to do that. I'd love for us to get a picture of Centerpoint at, you know, with Christmas in July. Um, but I want us to think about this. and This preparation of Jesus' arrival, or what some call preparing the way for Jesus, is very unique to Luke. And uh, we don't have time, of course, to read the whole chapter, but, but chapter 1 is focused entirely on this preparation time that happens before Jesus arrives on earth as a baby. And so this week, in, comp in, in your compass points, you'll read all of chapter 1. And there are two very major stories that, Jesus, uh, that Luke lines up for us in this first chapter. One is the story of John the Baptist. 
And we hear about the preparation and the, the, the prediction of John the Baptist coming as a baby. And we hear the, the story of, of, of the angel Gabriel going to Mary and preparing maybe to, uh, Mary to have a baby that's going to be a son as well. So we hear this sto- these two stories kind of going back and forth about the preparation of both John the Baptist and Jesus. And Luke takes this very seriously. John the Baptist is reverenced in all of the four Gospels, but only in Luke do we find that this this long story about John the Baptist and how important he is. All of the four Gospels talk about this prophet who's coming to prepare the way for the Messiah. John the Baptist is this person who comes inviting people to repent of their sins, to be washed clean in the, in the, in the waters of baptism so that their hearts and their lives may be, may be able to prepare to receive this newborn king, this Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And John is kind of this predecessor to Christ who will be called this newborn king. And John is important for several reasons, and we need to understand why John is important. John is important because the Old Testament always talks about, if you're familiar with the Israel story, there's always a king and there's always a prophet. And the king and the prophet accompany one another in Israel's story. It's kind of like a checks and balance system in, in the government of Israel, if you will, that there's the king who has the job of governing the people of Israel um, and, and, and leading the people and inspiring the people, but there's also the prophet. And the prophet's job is to keep the king in line with what God wants, wants the king to know and also to tell the people what, what God wants them to know, to challenge them and to comfort them when they need to be comforted. And this is the job of the prophet and the king. You remember that there is Saul, who is the first king of Israel. And as Saul is the first king of Israel, who's the prophet that that accompanies Saul? It's Samuel. So God sends Samuel to be the prophet under Saul. And when God's through with Saul, and because Saul wasn't listening to God, Samuel goes and finds King David and anoints anoints King David and tells him that he will now now be the king of Israel. And so Samuel is the prophet that is aligned with David. And when David becomes king, Samuel dies, and then there's Nathan. Nathan, who is a prophet. And on and on you go that there's a king and there's a prophet. And Luke knows this story very well, and he knows the history of the people of Israel. And he knows that if he's going to tell his people that something big is about to happen, that something that's going to change the world is about to happen, then and a new king is going to come, there better be a prophet who comes and prepares the way for that king. And that's why John the Baptist is so important. So telling the birth of John the Baptist is just as important in Luke as as Luke telling the story of the birth of Jesus. Because there's this Messiah that's going to come. And this Messiah isn't just going to be a king. He's going to be the king. And not only is he going to be the king, he's going to be a different kind of king than Israel has ever had before. A different kind of king than the world has ever seen before. And the people need to be ready with a prophet announcing this word, preparing the way for Jesus to come, to be ready to receive this new king. And so Luke Luke does this very remarkable job of paving the way for Jesus, Jesus to come by telling this remarkable, wonderful story of John the Baptist. This John who's going to prepare the way, who's going to make the path straight for the Lord to walk down. And there's a couple of really cool things that Luke does specifically in chapter 1 here that I'd like for us to talk about, about preparing the way for Jesus. And this is where we're getting to a little bit the message part of this, about what it means to have our lives prepared for us, how God works in our life to prepare for us a way to receive Christ, and how God goes before us to be ready to receive him and how God goes for us in our daily lives and our struggles and is preparing a great future for us. And these truly amazing things that Luke talks about in chapter 1, go back to this kind of big theological term that we use that, and I know you're familiar with it, it's called prevenient grace. Prevenient grace. And prevenient grace is, is we can talk about that as God's way of preparing the way for us. That God goes before us, that God, it's another way of talking about God going ahead of us and making our path straight, making things work in such a way that we can come to understand God. And prevenient grace works in such a way that we don't even know that it's happening. 
We don't even know that God is doing what God is doing behind the scenes for us. His love and His mercy is shown to us before we can even know what love looks like. That's what prevenient grace is. This is the kind of grace that God that goes before us before we can earn it, before we can do anything about it, before we can understand it or comprehend it on our own or acknowledge that it's even happened. Sometimes it goes before us before we're even alive. Where God is actively pursuing us, God is preparing a way for us. And Luke decides to dedicate this whole first chapter of his gospel to show us that God is actively preparing a way. God is pursuing us, and God is making our path straight. And he's making the path straight for Jesus, that through the, through te- the telling of John the Baptist that, that we, get this, we get this path that's laid out perfectly for Jesus to come. And that's how Luke wants to show God works in our lives as well. And I always think back to your faith journey. And I bet if you do examine your faith journey, you'll find that, you know, wow, there were some things that were going on before I even knew it that was drawing me to Christ. There were some things that were going on behind the scenes, and I, I didn't understand what was going on, but there were some doors that were being opened for me that I didn't know were being opened for me, that God was using other people in my life to, to help form me and prepare me to receive Christ. There, were, there was things that were going on in my life that I can't comprehend, but they were going on, and it can't be anything but the activity of God in my life to help me get to the point where I am today. Or maybe if you're going through a, th- a, th- a thick or thin place in your life, you're going through some struggles in life, you'll, you'll sense, if you look back on that, you'll say, oh, somebody was carrying me. Somebody was with me all along, and I didn't know. There was somebody protecting me. There was someone looking out for me, and I don't know who it was. The only person I can think of that it could be would be God, who was looking out for me. This is provenient grace. This is God going before us, preparing a journey ahead of us. It was God right there before you and with you. And still today, provenient grace is at work in our lives. Even after we come to faith in Christ, there are still moments in which God is carrying you. There are things that God is doing for you behind the scenes. There are people that God has prepared in in your life to, to help form you and to work with you. And even behind the scenes, make a way for you. And God is working in ways that maybe you think now are impossible. Things that you don't, in ways that you can't fathom right now. But God's working in a way to make the impossible possible. Because he loves you. In Luke, we get this very unique way in which this remarkable story of provenient grace is given to us. How God is actively pursuing us and how God is actively preparing a way for us. And one of those beautiful things about provenient grace that God that Luke shows us is that God sometimes uses his disciples. Sometimes he uses his people to help prepare a way. Now, all of the Gospels acknowledge that John the Baptist is the one who's supposed to prepare the way for the Messiah. They acknowledge that John is this prophetic voice in the wilderness crying out for sinners to repent, for them to be baptized, to be washed clean, so that they can receive the Messiah. But Luke... But Luke adds this, something that is truly remarkable. He adds a story about people who came before John and people who came before Jesus that made the way possible for both of them. So this is how great God is. God is not only preparing for Jesus to come, the greatest human being that ever is going to live, to come and to, to rescue us from sin, our, from sin himself. He's not only preparing a way for Jesus to be born, but he's preparing a way for the person who's going to prepare the way <laughs> for Jesus to come. That's how deep it goes. How remarkable is that, that God, God has planned out something so, so far ahead of us that he knows who the people are that are going to be showing up in our lives. And he knows who the people are that are going to be forming those people. That's what Luke's trying to tell us, is that God goes so far ahead of us. God, God is so great to us that he has a plan for us that we can't even fathom. That we can't even fathom. Luke tells us about the story of John the Baptist and his parents, and he talks about Zechariah and Elizabeth, his parents. And um, 
This is unique to Luke. And Zechariah is a priest that's serving in the temple, and he's serving at the altar of the incense, which is nearest to the Holy of Holies. He doesn't go into the Holy of Holies, but he's there in the presence of God in, 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 the most, in one of the most sacred parts of the temple. And there he's at the altar of the incense, and Zechariah sees this angel come before him, and he sees this vision of this angel, and the angel says, My name is Gabriel, and I have some news to share with you. You, Zechariah, along with your wife, y'all are going to become pregnant and have, have a son. And this son is going to be very special, and this son is going to have the power of Elijah, the great prophet, and you'll name him John. Now something about Zechariah is that Zechariah is kind of an older man, and so is his wife. They're, some would consider them elderly, in fact well beyond childbearing years. They've had a great life together. They're a great married couple, but they've not been able to have children. And and so Zechariah gets this news from the angel, and he can't believe it. He says, it's impossible. This This cannot happen. Here is God choosing to work a way, to pave a way in for John to come by giving this family a child that they've always wanted, a special child, but Zechariah resists believing it. He can't see how it's going to happen. He says, it's impossible. This can't happen. And what does the angel do? But in a polite term says, you know, hush. Be quiet. Close your mouth. Open your eyes. And there you'll see what God is preparing for you. Maybe that's a lesson for some of us. Shut your mouth. (laughs) Open your eyes. And then you can see what God is preparing for you. And so Zechariah goes back home and he can't talk, but he finds his wife pregnant. And, and all of these things that the, that the angel says has come true and is going to come true. And a whole new world of faith opens up to Zechariah and Elizabeth to receive this blessing that God is going to bless them with and to, to believe that God is providing a perfect way for them. Now on the other side of the story, we have a similar thing happening in Jesus' line. But it's on the other, age, other end of the age spectrum, if you will. The same angel, Gabriel, goes to Mary. This young woman, this young girl even, that's probably 13 or 14 years old, who, who isn't married, who's a virgin, who's never been with a man in, uh, in her life, and he goes to her and he says, I've got something special for you. I've got, God has something special for you to do. You're going to become pregnant, and you're going to have a son, and this son is going to be the son of God, and he's going to be truly remarkable, and you'll be blessed by him. And we know that this Mary, Mary this, this was an impossible situation for her as well. Luke makes a point to say that Mary was engaged to be married, but she had not been with Joseph. She was a virgin, had never, had never been with a man in any way whatsoever. And so on this other extreme, God is still choosing an impossible situation, an impossible way for something miraculous to occur. But unlike Zachariah's response, who resists that and says it's impossible, Mary has a very different response. Mary, this young girl that is confused and still doesn't quite understand what all of this means and what, what her life will look like in the future, but she's willing to accept it. She's willing to hear God's will for her life, and she's willing to go along with it. In fact, in verse 38 of the first chapter, she says, I am the Lord's servant. She says this to the angel, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be done with me just as you have said. These two stories are stories of provenient grace. They are stories of God breaking into our world to make a way for Jesus to come. They are stories of God using others in ways that they themselves cannot fully grasp or understand, in ways that are impossible for anybody in the world to understand. And, and there's a future that they can't even fathom for themselves. 30, it'll be 33 more years down the road. Most of them will be long gone, but 33 years down the road before God's final plan is revealed, when Jesus dies on a cross and then is raised from the dead to break open the gates of hell and death and to free God's people from their sins and to give them everlasting life. It'll be 33 years later where that plan is fully revealed, but God still chooses to use Zechariah 
and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph to prepare, to set up that path for Jesus Christ, our Messiah. And importantly for us to consider that God uses these impossible tasks to make the impossible possible. But if God can help an elderly couple become pregnant and give birth to a prophet that has the powers of Elijah, and if God can work in the life of a young virgin girl to give birth to the most important person in human history, if God can do that, what is he preparing for you? What's possible in your life? What are the things that God might be saying to you or might be preparing for you or God might be setting up for you for you to do that will glorify him? Can you hear God speak to you? Can you hear God say to you what reveal to you what it is that he's preparing for you to do? Here's the last point about how God prepares the way for us. It doesn't matter how we respond. When we hear God speak to us, it doesn't matter how we will respond. God, God will still use you. He'll still prepare a way for you in spite of you or through you. Zechariah, on one hand, is doubtful. He resists this, this word from God for what he's about to do. He won't believe that this is the will of the Lord through him, even though he's working in the most holy place on the planet, in the presence of God every day. He, he, he feels God all around him, and God's saying something to him, and he resists that. He can't, he can't fathom it. Yet, God is still preparing something for his life. And on the other hand, there's this young girl, barely old enough to know what, how children are usually conceived, scared out of her mind, confused, knowing that what the world holds ahead of her is going to be some great obstacles that are scary. There's going to, she's vulnerable to a lot of abuse by a lot of people. And yet her response is, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be done with me, just as you have said accepting, humble, and willing to follow and trust in the Lord wherever the Lord decides to lead her. So our question this morning is, how, how will you respond to the ways that God is preparing for you? How, how will you respond to the roads that are being paved for you to walk down? You can certainly be like Zachariah and you can resist you can resist the things that God is asking you to do. You can certainly say it's impossible for me to do what you're asking me to do, Lord. There's no way that this can happen. And we can dive, dodge, duck, dip and dodge all we want away from God's will, but God still has a way. He's powerful enough to nudge us just in the gentle way that he does, in the loving way that he does to get us right back on track because he has prepared a way for us. We can also be like a young girl and, and be willing and accepting to do what God wants us to do, knowing that, that the will of God is perfect and trusting fully in his will, but knowing that there's going to be obstacles for us to face, there's going to be mountains for us to climb, there's going to be dirt that we're going to have to go through, and yet we know that God is still working in, our way, in a way in our life that prepares a beautiful destination for us. That no matter what we have to go through, God is still going to be with us, he's going to carry us through, and he's going to give us a beautiful destination the nation. So which way are you going to respond? Which way are you going to respond to what God is doing for you? Because God, the creator and maker of the universe and everything that is in it, as great as he is, he loves you. He has given you a name. He has given you a purpose. He has given you something to do that will glorify him and that will be best for your life. How will you respond to it? He's still up there, no matter how old you are, or how young you are, how advanced in your discipleship journey you are, or how new to the faith you are, or whether you know Jesus Christ or not. He's up there preparing something great for you. He's got you in his hand. He's forming you with all of the love of the universe. He's got you in his hand. He will not leave you. 
He will not drop you. He will not forsake you. He's there for you. He will not give up with you. He is your God. And He has something in store for you. Whether we resist Him or whether we go along with it. Do you know what God is planning for you? If you don't, that's okay. But I think what Luke tells us in this opening chapter, what he shares with us, is there are people who learn one way or another that they can trust in God, that God can make the impossible possible, and that if we trust Him, if we say, yes, we will do your will, we will follow your ways, we will stay faithful to you, that if we do that, the God of the universe prepare beautiful and wonderful things for us. Will you pray with me? O oh God of wonders, you truly are remarkable in the way that you reveal yourself to us. You're truly remarkable in the ways in which you, you show your love to us, that you have gone before us before we can even fathom it, that you have, you have given your love and your mercy to us in ways that we, we still don't understand fully. But all of that is your plan for us. You are preparing a way for us into the future. Whatever it may hold, however dark it may seem right now, whatever mountains we know we have yet to climb, you are there with us. You are preparing a bright future for us, your people. So help us, O oh God, this day to recommit our lives to you, to follow in the paths that you have set before us, trusting in your way for holy holy is your name. Amen.
As we go from this place today, may the Lord, oh God, the creator of the universe, the God of wonders beyond our galaxy, who has made you and who loves you, who has called you by name, may you go forth in his name to proclaim his good news. May you go with the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit to go and serve and go in the places that he has laid out before you, now and forever. Amen.